a brain warrior with integrative thinking. Today is um, April the 12th, 2020. It's my 29th day of lockdown in the corona pandemic. I'm speaking to you from San Francisco. And this little chat is for my grandchildren. Max, Abby, Zoe, and Juliet. And it's to give you a, a quick summary about what I've learned about integrative thinking and why I'm sharing this with you today. I, I believe that each one of us, if we have children and, and even if we don't, should leave behind one idea that we think could make our presence in this little journey on this planet better. So that's my idea for you. Now I'm going to share with you what I mean by integrative thinking and being a brain warrior and I'm going to make a pitch to you about why I believe you should be. And the chances are that this is probably not going to land. Because one of the things that will be obvious as I go through my, share with you my sort of learnings over the last 67 years, that's how old I am, is that if you tell people what to do, their non-conscious brain will have a pushback and they're probably not going to do it. So I have to take that chance because um, I would have liked to rather give this message to you over time, you're, t you're, you're so young and... By the time you listen to this, the world will be a different place. But I hope that the basic idea will have endured. Um, and there is a chance that a week from now, I may not even be around. I'm at the age where the coronavirus, where there's no immunity, um, is basically most affecting people my age. So, it's not to be dramatic, it's just I wanted to put out this message in case that happens. If it doesn't, then hopefully there will be lots of other pieces that you can put together yourself through my books, videos, podcasts, but um, this is it. So what is integrative thinking? Well, it's about bringing together the pieces, the information that you're going to come across and looking for the patterns that matter, the frameworks, the models. I'm not going to talk to you as the tiny young children that you are. I'm going to summarize to you what I told to Harvard students last week. Because by the time you watch this, whatever age as an adolescent your parents may or may not draw this little video to your attention and podcast, um, you hopefully will be in a better position to kind of put the information together but essentially that's what it is. So I'm going to take you through what I've learned about the brain and end off on why being a brain-based warrior is about helping to forge a brain-based society and um, I'll pitch to you why that's a big challenge but I'll t hope to leave you at least with some thoughts about my, why you may want to consider it. So starting off with the, with the end in mind, um, I think it's firstly always useful in, in integrative thinking to start with the end in mind. The end in mind is your death. You're on your deathbed. What are you going to think about? What was meaningful to you? Did you have a passion? Did you have a journey that mattered? Are you going to leave behind some message? And if so, what's it going to be? So I always start with the end in mind. The beginning is the beginning of when we think this universe started, which is 13.8 billion years ago. Big Bang. And you can follow the trajectory of how we got to here. And humans kind of seemingly evolved, separated from apes about 10 million years ago. And in the last 5 million years, 
it seems that Australopithecus, the first hominid to stand upright about five million years ago, so we evolved in our backsides before we evolved in our brains, and from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to us, Homo sapiens, about five million years, we trebled in brain size. No other species has done this. A dolphin, for example, had the same brain size today as it did 30 million years ago. So there's something fascinating about that. But the implications of that are what I want to talk to you about. So we've got this huge brain. But I want to share with you that our brain is not that unique. In other ways, it's very similar to every other animal on the planet. And that was discovered, the first integrative thinker, in my mind, was actually a Greek philosopher called Socrates. And he said, the only good is knowledge, and the only evil is ignorance. And then another person, 1859, published a book, his name was Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, where he showed that and this was the ultimate integrative thinker in a way. He, he, the first time I ever saw him, he set up a picture like this of a tree. Literally, a picture like this. After a lifetime of studying all species on the planet, his point was that every animal is interconnected. We all come from the same common ancestor. And we're all made of the same stuff. And that blew my mind. And his idea has remained current, at least plausible, and people have modified it. Obviously, he couldn't have foreseen everything, but he, foresee that in, he foresaw that interconnectedness, including our brains. And that idea is as important today in helping us get a kind of understanding of our planet more broadly as it was 150 years ago when it was published. There are many other great thinkers that have, have affected my integrative thinker. Sokolov, a Russian guy who discovered how we learn automatically. Um, Roger Sperry, who split the brain and worked out a lot of stuff about it. Um, Walter Freeman, who was a friend of mine, who was the father of brain dynamics, how the brain works as an adaptive system. Lots, about 30 people that really influenced my thinking, who were the deepest integrative thinkers. And I'm not going to go through them in detail now, other than to say that be open to learn from the greatest minds that ever existed. Because strangely enough, most of their thoughts interconnect into this integrative thinking model. I'll give you an example. Charles Darwin, when he traveled the world looking for all the information that allowed him to bring this theory together, the origin of species, the origin of species and how we all interconnected, including our brains are kind of super similar in many ways. Obviously, we've trebled, but still, amazing similarity, the blueprint of all those brains across all animals, amazingly similar in many ways. But he had a golden rule, and his golden rule was that whenever he came across a bit of information that violated his expectancy, that, that was different to what his framework, his model was, he immediately wrote it down. And he was voracious in the way he looked widely across disparate, different, complementary areas to distill his theory. And he challenged it all the time. Now that's interesting because when I go through the brain story, you'll see that we have non-conscious and conscious ways of thinking and that non-consciously we have a bias called the confirmation bias because we want to feel safe. So he challenged that confirmation bias very intensely, and I urge you to do the same, or any brain warrior to do the same. So what I'm going to do is just give you some, a summary, a snapshot summary of some of the things I've learned about the brain as an integrative system, and then end off with telling you how to assess and train and track your own brain and rewire it in the way that you choose yourself. And I'll end off with a pitch that you're probably not going to buy, but that I feel compelled to share with you, which is the brain-based society. How do you apply these insights about the brain?
to the society you're going to live in. Now, I may have lost you already, but too bad, dude. I am your grandfather, and that's part of the penalty of genetics. You carry around your genes and your children and grandchildren, and thousands of kids you're going to have, thanks to you, are going to be hopefully have some sort of legacy to help them shape their lives. All right, let's start with the brain. Look, the reality is, until you know your brain and your strengths and your weaknesses, your timing and your thresholds, and until you have aligned your non-conscious intuition and your conscious rational thinking, you are walking around in the dark. If you take away nothing else, take away that. So what do I mean? Well, turns out that the brain has 85 billion neurons, and I don't have a script to tell you this. So this is going to be a bit of a ramble, but hopefully we'll get through it together. 85 billion neurons, nerves that are interconnected into neural networks, and another 85 plus billion supporting cells called glia. But these 85 billion neurons form the most complex cosmos within your ears that anybody has even conceived. There's nothing like the brain. It is your superpower, if you want to use it. Now, the blueprint of the brain for all animals is there's sensory input from your environment and, there's a, and then you act on it. So there's sensory input, motor output, and there's a nucleus, there's a sort of aggregation of neurons in the middle of your brain called the thalamus that gets everything in and out. So what about the decisions? How do, how do you decide what to do? If you've got all this input and you've got to get out of the, act on them, well, there's a guiding principle, an organizing principle, and that is to stay safe. The brain has evolved to keep us out of danger. So number one, everything in the wiring, in the evolution, in that input-output is first and foremost to stay safe. Never forget that. Now the next layer is that the brain, in staying safe, which dominates until the brain is safe, it's very hard for the brain to go after rewards effectively because it's like consumed by safety. And in order to do this most effectively, the brain has got these specialized networks like sensory input, motor output, memory specialty networks, focus, planning, um, but it also has two modes of processing. You can be rational, conscious, aware, do things in a systematic, evidence-based way. And we are brought up in the Western cultures anyway to really highly value that way of thinking. It's great. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the brain is actually driven by a non-conscious process of huge numbers of networks that automatically, within a fifth of a second, that's 250 milliseconds, the brain automatically needed a quick snapshot, like a shorthand, to quickly determine what was threatening or rewarding. Boom, 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 every fifth of a second. Well, it's so fast, you don't even know it's happening. And yet there it is driving your life. Now you can ignore it and you'll end up being a schmuck. But if you at least try and attune to it, you will be able to potentially get it to better align, connect to the rational thinking, which happens at about a fifth of a, half a second, 500 milliseconds. You start becoming aware of these snap judgments that you're making, these biases that you have almost. Now these snap judgments, this fifth of a second, is determined, shaped a little bit by your genetics. Sorry for any bad pieces I've passed on, but there's some pretty good ones in there too, let me tell you. Um, but it is a reality. It's a lot of variation. Each of, the, each of your cells in your whole body and brain has a genetic code with a billion letters. 
Um, and so any of those could be a little bit of a challenge or, or, or help. But there's your genetics. You then get conditioned how your mom and dad and hopefully me and others in your, who love you are going to reinforce and validate you for what they kind of want you to be. They're shaping. We're all shaping each other all the time. It's part of the gig. It's part of our, we're just simple bipedal apes in reality. And we, we, we're tribal. We want to believe and belong and keep safe. So it's kind of still a pretty primitive phase in the human cycle. But it is still amazing what we've inherited here in these brains. Anyway, the point is that you've got this combination of factors that affect these snap judgments and these biases. So what's a bias? The bias is to stay safe. That's a bias. Another bias is that confirmation bias I was telling you about Darwin. If you want to stay safe, one of the best ways, or the simplest primitive ways, is to go, I will find ways to keep me thinking in this simple manner because it makes me feel safe. Doing the same things, belonging to the right groups, um, there are a hundred, over a hundred biases of that kind. A hundred that are shaping so many aspects of who you're going to be. So when you come with your rational stuff, you need to know how it works because you rationalize anything. So you can rationalize why you want to be a certain way if you look for the confirming evidence in your bias. You can rationalize anything if you want to just stay safe and not deal with the probabilities of the universe. It's a highly variable universe. Massive interconnections. You can ignore that because your brain maybe genetically has been wired to be a little anxious and you were conditioned maybe to be a little too consistent with your tribal thinking or primitive thinking. But it is what it is. Sooner or later, you've got to find out for yourself. Can you deal with this complexity and with the uncertainty that comes with it, the probabilistic universe that seems to be what it is? Or are you going to settle for something more stable because you just can't tolerate uncertainty very well? That's your choice. But at least understand, have a framework that that seems to be the mechanisms of what's going on. So underneath that process of safety, reward, biases, non-conscious intuition and biases and rational, logical thinking are a number of key brain capacities. Now those non-conscious biases and intuition are actually called emotions. These are the emotions that in a fifth of a second you're picking up cues. Is this safe? Is this reward? Is this person's body language friendly? When they smile at me, do the corners of their eye crinkle? That's an authentic smile. Or are they smiling at me just with their mouth? That is an inauthentic smile. Hundreds of cues are coming at you all the time and your brain is processing them unbelievably efficiently. Those are your emotions. And then in half a second, your body gets the impact of the effect of that decision, those snap decisions. Is it safe? If it's not safe, it's going to activate a system in your body that's called the fight-flight system. You've got to get out of there if it's not safe. Or at least be aware if it's not physically threatening. could be socially threatening. You could be having some hypocritical person who's telling you something with their words, but their body language could be telling you something else. Their voice, intonation, and pitch could be telling you something else. That they're not being authentic. And what they're saying is not aligning to their body language. When you feel that mismatch, your heart rate's going to go up. And your, your variability of your heart rate's going to go down. you just got to get oxygen to your muscles to basically, your focus decreases. You, you're basically very limited in your thinking when you're threatened. On the other hand, if what you're dealing with is positive and rewarding, you activate a different system called your calm, flexible, vagus system. V-A-G-U-S. Very important system. These are the two ways in which your brain and body, these are the two states you have. These are your options. And so those are your feelings. You feel your heart rate going up, you sweat. I'm sweating here because of the heat and the light. So sometimes you've got to read it in context. 
Um, so that's the story. So your emotions, fifth of a second cues, your feelings is your subjective experience of the effect of those emotions which you feel in your heart rate, your sweat rate. And then you've got your cognition, your actual thinking now, your memory, your focus, your planning. You've got this memory now, this rational memory, this conscious rational memory that can kick in to best deploy what your brain has now determined as your best option. So you're non-consciously, you're probably looking at many options and you sort of nudged towards the best one by your emotions. And then your rational thinking can help you get to the best one. But sometimes you don't have time, so you just got to go with your emotions. And then you have this ability to control it all, self-control. How do you put it all together? How do you regulate this? So those are your capacities, the capacities of your emotion, your feeling, your cognition, and your self-control. Not complicated. It's a very simple model when you think about it. Safety first. And reward will come with safety, more likely. Non-conscious, intuition, emotions, super rapid. Conscious, thinking about it in more detail, a little bit more cautious, more evidence-based. It checks it out and can sometimes override the emotions if you have to, if it's the wrong emotional quick choice you've made. And then the ability to feel it. And that all feeds back into your brain and also shapes you to go in a certain direction further. You know, people will never remember what you said. People will usually not even remember what you did. But they will always remember the way that you make them feel. The feelings are important. And a woman called Maya Angelou was there as another integrative think thought thinker who made that up that saying that I've just plagiarized and given to you. And then there's the ability to self-regulate, to control it all. So that's the essence. That's the snapshot of the brain. Before I, I go to the second and third pieces of this sharing, with second pieces being how to assess it, train it and track it, and then brain-based society, which is my real pitch to you, um, this is just the prelude. Um, and is I want you to know that you have about 50,000 thoughts a day. 50,000 thoughts a day. And part of what we're going to move to next is to look at how can you shape those thoughts? If they're non-conscious and they're happening so quickly, how many of them, if you've got a negative thought, like let's say you're not feeling safe, the coronavirus, I'm not feeling safe, I'm on my 29th day of lockdown. And I literally know that I could be on a ventilator seven days from now. Hopefully not. But I have friends intubating people in hospitals nearby. And... So it's not the greatest safe feeling, hence this rushed video. But there's a part of me that's also going, you know, I'm 67. I, I, I got through a lot, man. I, 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 I went through all the science degrees, BSc, honors, master's, PhD. I did a medical training. I set up the world's first standardized international database. I got an amazing, helped found an amazing company that's scaling some of the stuff. I kind of, you know, I've, I've kind of like done my dash. I mean, I've done what I can. So on my deathbed, my only last thoughts now is what I've done useful and are you guys going to find it useful? It's probably one of the most important things to me. Or, and even if not, is that hopefully something in this will be useful to you. So that's the kind of reality. I do have a sense of equanimity at some level. Like I've done my best. Um, and along the way, I learned a lot. And lucky enough to be born at a time where these great thinkers are the, that I never met because they were dead before I arrived. Or some of them became my friends and did die. And some of them still are alive and help hugely shaping my thoughts and experience. And I've had some incredibly loyal friends and family and some opportunists and people who have been very bad judgment in, that I brought into my life. It's kind of that's the life. That's what you're going to face. Good and bad decisions, dude. But every one of those 50,000 thoughts is a decision. Am I going to be negative and unstrategic? Am I going to be positive? And they're both contagious. Negative and positive thinking are equally contagious. Probably negative a bit more contagious, but there you go. So that's the story. There are 50,000 of those thoughts. Now, I want to 
I've said a little bit about the non-conscious thoughts and these hundred biases and the impact of genetics and your conditioning and even your bonding, the way your mother bonded to you. Was it a secure bonding? Was it anxious? These all have effects. Then your life experience. Did you have early life stress? Did you get bullied at school? Did you make wrong decisions too early? How did you deal with your first loves? How did you choose your friends? Were, they, were you loyal? Were they loyal? Um, did you do cool stuff or did you just drug and drink yourself into oblivion? All these things happen. That's all part of the journey. But in those 50,000 thoughts, you have a choice. If you become a brain warrior especially, you'll probably do it more effectively to influence them and choose yourself. And that's kind of like one of the main things. So before we go to assess, train and track your brain, I do just want to add a couple of more thoughts about the brain. So that's the kind of blueprint. There's a lot of details about the brain, as you could imagine, and inordinate amounts. There's a lot we don't know about the brain, like how even consciousness works. Funnily enough, non-conscious, what I'm saying to you about this non-conscious intuition, we kind of, in some ways, know quite a lot about it. Ironically, because we still can't get a handle on it fully, but consciousness is, is more tricky. Like, how does this all happen at this time scale that I can even speak to you? But a lot of stuff we don't know, but there's a lot we do. And the difference between a peak performer and an expert and a novice or a dilettant is that novices, amateurs, dilettantes, usually people are not that very successful, know a lot of stuff they can but they don't know how to put it all together. They're not integrative in their thinking. They don't have a framework, a model. So they don't know how the essence works. So they're kind of in the dark, even just from that, before we get to thresholds and timing, they just, it's tough. You can get away with it. You can walk the walk and talk the talk, but you've got to know. If you really get to be an expert in a few things, and in my view, what better thing than the brain? It's where the, it's, it's the mother load, man. Um, it's hard. It's hard to really be, be integrative. So with the, um, with the 50,000 thoughts, you can choose yourself, but you need a strategy. You need a strategy to do it. And, and the last piece before we go on to the brain kind of assessment and training and tracking is when you go and study the brain, which you'll do in one way or another, whether it's through me or through anybody else, or university or probably online by then that you'll be able to do all the kind of stuff that I did over 15 years at university you'll probably be able to do in a few months online but whatever it is timing is everything so far the aggregation of information in the non-integrative thinking has been about what is it in the brain what connects to where how many pieces does it have what are the you know what are the details about nerves neural networks the genetics the whole brain it's, it's so hard that it's usually siloed it's the opposite of integration hugely important information it's the grist for them all but it's kind of overwhelming if you choose to become an integrative thinker you're looking at the whole system and you're looking at the timing. So let me give you a concrete example. When I ran the Brain Institute that I founded, um, it, there was a patient that I once saw, and it was bringing people together from all different disciplines under the same roof, across the landscape of the mind. And, and there was a patient in the ward, um, he had Parkinson's disease, he could barely walk. I mean, he was shuffling along. He was a World War II veteran, wonderful man, and, um, could barely walk, he was shuffling, shuffling, shuffling. So something in the mechanics, in the pieces of his movement networks were broken. But here's the point. He stopped and hummed to himself and he could dance seamlessly. How's that possible? Similarly, I saw many patients who were, had strokes, they had a bleed in their brain and they couldn't speak, but they could sing. How's that possible? It's possible because ultimately the brain is about timing, walking, talking, throwing a ball. It's amazing. In the, there's a massive timing. It's a massive timing system from single nerves. That when single nerves, they, each nerve gets like on average 5,000 inputs of excitation and inhibition. And only when it reaches a threshold, a threshold, a point where the excitation 
hits a certain level, minus 50 millivolts in this case, it fires. And if it doesn't reach that level, it doesn't fire. Now, everything that is going to be in your life is about thresholds. So when there's a dangerous thing happening, do you activate that fight-flight system to get you out of danger? Only if it reached the threshold. To switch on your calm, flexible vagus system, when's that going to happen? When you reach the threshold, when you're calm and flexible enough, it'll happen and you'll become more calm and more flexible. You learn because neurons that fire together wire together. So when you're being conditioned by your parents about what you should eat, what you should think, what you should do, how you should behave, those are neurons firing together and wiring together. That is making you who you are. Every day, with every 50,000 thoughts, you are rewiring yourself. And so, that's the thresholds, that's the timing, that's the brain story, and that's the essence. Are you with me so far? Does this make sense, dudes? There's lots of other details. I mean, we have networks in our brain, one that I'm fascinated by called the default mode network, DMN, where there's a kind of, when we just sitting and relaxing, like I'm sitting now and just thinking about you guys, there's a default network in my brain, that's my past, my present, thinking about the future, and it's remarkably, if you want to change, you've got to change your default mode network, your structural core. So there's lots of pieces, but the integrationist has a huge amount of detail, voracious reader. Honestly, if I had to put the books that I've read on a pile, if they would fill this room. And they were wide. They came from a lot of books about the brain, but also about philosophy, history, the same patterns of mistakes that humans have made, um, just a lot of stuff. If I had to put into this room the number of publications, scientific publications I've read, they would probably fill two or three rooms. Because that's what I believed. I wanted to put it all together to see what mattered. What really driving this stuff? What are the central ideas that matter and how are they interconnected? So, that's the essence. So, on to the second phase. The question is, so what can I do about this? So I got the drift, integration, put it all together, find the essence, read widely, put the pieces together, be a voracious distiller of information in whatever way you find most useful to do. I use color coding, I, 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 I was like, amazing number of strategies to get it done. Cards, before there were even computers, um, but now they're computers and I can do it in voice files. It doesn't matter how you do it. And by the time you see this video, if you do, you will have little bots on the internet um, that are going out and finding information that is useful to you and coming back and presenting it to you in ways that are useful. But have a framework. And if you can find something better than the brain, pff, I'd love to know what it is. So we move on to the next phase, which is, okay, how do you assess your brain and train it to rewire yourself, to be, choose who you want to be in every one of those 50,000 thoughts? And what is the end in mind? You, are you going to find a goal that's worthy of your life? Your life. You only have one. And you're going to go through a lot of stuff. How are you going to best prepare for that? Just going to let it happen? Or are you going to make it happen? Well, and then, how are you going to track it? How are you going to check that you're actually doing something that's moving you in the direction that you want? So, assess, train, track. Assess. You can do it online. You can assess your key brain capacities. I happen to be with what I believe is the world's best company um, that does that online. A lot of people do it, use it, and it's going to scale further, thanks to an amazing, amazing team. But the point about it is that assessing your emotions, your feelings, your thinking, your cognition, and how you can self-control, you, you want to assess those capacities. You want to have some objective insight into yourself. And what's not in, if you don't want to use the one that, that, that I helped create, 
use whatever one you find at the time that's the best available. Um, my hope is that that'll still be. But um, you can measure your personality, your preferences, which will tell you, are you, do you have an open mind? Are you open? Are you, are you conscientious? Um, do you, so you can look at those preferences as well. You'll look at your genetics for sure. You'll be looking at your genetics. It's already possible. Um, but by the time you see this, it'll be absolutely mandatory. I'll be basic grist for the mill. You'll know your genetics, which is cool. Information is power. Models and frameworks and integrative ones are empowering. Big difference. Um, so assessment is possible and you can do it often to get that snapshot. It's like looking into your brain. You want to see it and you want to see it objectively. So that's the assessment. Training your brain is a different ball game. Now, training your brain, you want to do through actual tools. You want to use simulations, but you want to start with tools. Now, the tools that we currently use today are very simple. So let's say you want to train your focus. It can be a very simple thing. You just want to focus on keeping a ball aiming towards a target for 30 or 40 seconds. That's not going to... That's, a kind of trivial exercise. What's not trivial is how you train. When you train anything, you put into your mind, what is the purpose of this training? What is the end in mind? Everything starts with the end in mind. 13.8 billion years ago to the, your deathbed. But right now when you're going to train something like focus, why am I training to keep this ball steady and moving towards a target? Because focus, if that's what I'm training, is about task completion. So before I train this, it's to remind myself, how do I do and get to finish my tasks and stay on track? That's what I'm training. Then suddenly, even the simple exercise of keeping the ball on track, rewires your brain, trains your brain like a muscle, just like when you build your muscles. You push them, beyond their capacity, then they heal and they get bigger. You push your training with the end in mind and you build that network in your brain for increased focus, increased memory, increased ability to read people's emotions, increased ability to read voice cues. What's the most important cue of the most powerful people? Silence. I haven't been using that much. I'm an extrovert rather than an introvert. You'll see that's in the genetics. And already, of the four of you, you work out which ones of you are introverts or extroverts. It's pretty obvious to me. But that even has an effect. But you can choose yourself. Introverts, extroverts, personality style is just the surface. The real action is how you use these 85 billion neurons. It's not your genetics are not your destiny, but you ignore them at your peril. But it's how you use this, so how you train them. So you train with the end in mind, the how. So let me give you one other example. It's an amazing training to switch to your calm, flexible system rather than being your fight, flight, stress system. So you want to switch your stress. Stress is the number one thing you should train. If you do not have stress mastery, you're not just walking around in the dark. You're groveling around in the dark. So you've got to find ways to deal with your stress. And the best way that I found is, and I didn't discover it, this is part of my network of people I've learned from, um, was to breathe at six breaths per minute. Now, I'm not going to go through the details. You'll find it if you're interested in it. But it is the best break of that fight-flight stress system is simply breathing at six breaths per, per minute. And you follow a breathing bar, you listen to sound, and I have other collaborators that are working on the coolest sounds and ways to stimulate your brain to get all of this on track. So there are increasing ways, by the time you see this, there'll be amazing augmented reality, you'll be walking around with some sort of visor that can do all of this in 3D in a very simulated in, way, and you'll be computers will be so sophisticated that there'll be a massively tight interconnection between the technology, your brain, and ways to train. But the principles are the same. Neurons that fire together, wire together, start with the end in mind, 
and learn stress mastery first. That six breaths per minute is just an example. There's a lot of other breath things you can do. You want to start with your breath. By the way, that six breaths per minute breathing strengthens your blood pressure system. That's why it works so well. So you want to find this final point, I'll say, as part of the biggest big picture thing about training, is that the closer you get to the mechanism of how your brain works and your body works, the bigger the impact's going to be, obviously. Now, think about that. The closer you get to the mechanism, the more impactful it's going to be. So when you have to choose between what's going to switch off my stress system, go for the one that's most biological and that's most physiological. It's strengthening your blood pressure. That's pretty amazing. Put your brain in a very calm, flexible state. That's pretty cool. So you want to find the ones first that really get to the core. And then there are lots of other things. It's what works for you that matters. So in training, lots of tools. Try what works for you like a smorgasbord. Try everything. Just like the Darwin who read everything. Just like all the integrative thinkers I've met. Try everything. And then find what works for you. And put it into a framework. Put it into a framework. Integrate it. Integrate it. Distill it. Find the essence. Add to it. Because when you've got the essence, all these details fit into a framework so much more seamlessly than if you're just trying to aggregate all the facts like a dilettante. You've got all these facts to try and impress people externally. Uh, it's not an internal powerful thing. It's the difference between external validation to impress people and internal validation to impress yourself and to empower yourself and to feel that power and to use it judiciously and with, with a sense of humility because you compared to this system and the evolution that you're lucky enough to have inherited over literally billions of years but certainly millions is a huge privilege and you don't want to mess you don't want to mess with that so just appreciate it and do the most with it so that's the issues of training there's lots of other details like you want to build habits so if you want to improve your focus you've got to train to do that task completion every day or if you want to switch off your stress you've got to do that breathing in the morning and three breaths a day at any time you feel stressed at six breaths a minute will get you into that better state and the stronger your muscle the easier you'll go into it the stronger the neural network I mean muscle metaphorically and um, so you want to train and you want to like nudge yourself every hour I love the hourly nudge every hour little nudge put yourself into the right frame of mind calm flexible put yourself into a strategic positive frame of mind Attitude is very important. And do it every hour. Think about the discipline of that. Have some water, stand up, walk around. The brain gets tired. The brain is not wired and designed to, to think, to, to last for long periods of time. Even this chat with you is way over time already. And there's more to go. So, um, not a lot more, you'll be happy to know. But um, every hour, nudge your brain. And so the, 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 the final piece about, about this training is you want to create habits. And a habit is um, really neural networks that fire together, wire together. And a habit goes in a very specific way. And it goes something like this. 1, 7, 20, 30, and 1,000. So... The first time, this is the sort of journey. This is the time. Woo, woo. This is time. And this is the evidence of your habit training. Do you train more? If you're training something, is your score getting better? The first time you do something is critical. Because if you're not ready to change and do this, change is a threat, remember. If you want to change something, for most people, why they find developing new habits, choosing themselves, is it's hard. Because safety first means that they want consistency. They don't want to change unless it's beneficial enough. So some people are just not ready and they push to do things. People at work tell them, their partners tell them, their parents tell them, but they're not ready. But when you're ready, the first time you do something is huge. You're ready to roll. By the seventh time, you've trained something new. It doesn't matter what it is. You've learned 
the most probably that you're going to learn in seven goes. You sort of started to get the drift of how to do this. By the 20th time, we've shown that you're starting to get a significant benefit and you're starting to change. That network's getting wired. By the 30th time of training, 30-day challenge, you're kind of starting to get this into a sort of beginning of a habit. And then you want to transfer that into your daily life. So by the time you've done it a thousand times, it's, it's automatic. Now it's going into your non-conscious part of your, parts of your brain because it's automatically going to happen. But from there to there is a long journey. So how long does that take? Well, I've drawn it here as if it's 30. The truth of the matter is we don't know. Everybody has a different time it takes to consolidate that habit. For some people it's like 20 days, for some people it's like 200. It depends on the habit, depends on the person. But you can track it. You can check it out. If you're quantifying this for yourself, and look, I'm doing it just on a piece of cardboard here. If you can track it every day, how did I do today? What's my score? Am I going in this direction or am I flatlining and starting to go up here? But you know when it's plateauing out like this, you've reached the point where that habit is consolidated. And now you can move into the big league of that habit which is how do I use it effectively? Habits also come from small daily steps. You want to do something every day that's small. Now why is that? Because the chemistry in your brain, there are only two chemicals I'm going to talk about. The one is when you win, you secrete dopamine. It's a reward chemical. The brain likes to win. The brain doesn't like feeling unsafe. That's a different chemical. Adrenaline, it's not, it's not great. And it consequently leads to other chemicals like cortisol, where if you secrete them for too long, it does you a lot of, a lot of harm. So, when you win, you secrete dopamine, and then you share that win with people, and you secrete oxytocin, which is the bonding chemical. That's what makes you change. Dopamine. Now, people can come, become addicted to dopamine. It's not good if you have stuff you like too much, like if people drink, take drugs gambling, all sorts of weird stuff, because they love the dopamine and it has, takes over their lives, so that's not great. But the principle is it's all, a, it's all the right balance. Um, and it's the balance of thresholds, not just balance in a simplistic way. It's finding where's the right amount of dopamine for you in getting those small wins. So if the win is small, if, you, if the little training every day is small, you're likely to, to get it done, you're likely to succeed and therefore secrete the dopamine. So that's why small steps are important. And there are other strategic ways that you can do it. Like you want, to, you want to use what's called anchoring, which is if I want to do my, so for example, for me, when I brush my teeth in the morning, I trigger the thought that I've got to do my stress mastery training, my six breaths per minute. And I'll, um, I'll, rem I'll, remember, I'll remember that um, I've got to do that before I leave the house. So that's my anchor. My anchor is brushing my teeth and it triggers the thought, the habit, that I need to do my six breaths a minute training to, um, to, to get that done, to put myself in the right attitude for the day. And the same before I go to sleep. I want to do that before I go to sleep so it makes me sleep better. And small steps, anchoring, but also what's called deliberate practice. The real peak performers, the difference in peak performers is they train in a very, very granular way. They, they really obsessive about these small steps and they're very obsessive about getting feedback, objectively tracking it. They often have coaches, but you can use friends, coaches, yourself, apps, but feedback's important because you can see am I on the right track. So there's lots of ways where you can push yourself out of your comfort zone to get to the next layer and get the feedback and just keep what's called iteratively optimizing. You just want to keep getting better. Now the peak performers, they're super open to anything new that's going to help them. So training, it's all the same principles, but it just depends on where you sit in the normal distribution. So this is my lightning rod for people who have mental health challenges. This is my tick sign for well-being, and the peak performers are the top of the triangle. So if you look at a normal distribution, if you've got a mental health challenge, the kind of training you're going to need is going to be a lot more targeted to the mental health challenge. So for example, if you've got anxiety, you want to focus on training stress mastery first. If you've got depression, you've probably got magnified negativity bias, so you want to find ways to switch from negative to positive thinking. If you're in the well-being category, the middle 
68% of the normal distribution. Um, you're going to try just be open to find ways to just improve all these aspects of your life. Same ingredients, the same principles, integrative model up here. And if you're a peak performer, you're likely to be doing deliberate practice and really pushing yourself in a thoughtful, detailed way. You, you're unlikely to have non-conscious pushback when people tell you things because you're scouring your world to go, I want to know stuff. You tell me, I'll find a way to use it. So the principles are the same. Now, the interesting thing is that from what we've seen in this world's biggest brain database that I helped set up is that everybody has all of this. Everybody has a bit of mental health challenges, negative thoughts, stress, a bit of depression, everyone. Everyone has periods where they kind of feel okay. And everyone has moments where they feel, hey, I'm in flow here. I've put it all together. I'm a peak performer. So, and this fluctuates. This can fluctuate in a day. So what is the difference between these three categories? Or not categories, it's a continuum. These people just have magnified variants of normality. If we all have all these pieces, these people have just got too much stress and they're not coping. Coping is the other variable. These people are kind of putting it together pretty well and these people are going for it. My hope is that you go for it. All right, so we've got assessment, training, tracking. You've got a drift about the brain. Hopefully you'll also train on an hourly and nudge yourself every hour to push yourself up where you should be. My, also my hope for you in, in choosing to aim for peak performance is that you also are a little bit creative. What do I mean by that? Well, creativity is the highest form of thinking. What is that? What is creativity? Well, creativity This is kind of how it works. So creative people are people who are generating new ideas. What is a new idea? A new idea is a new connection of thoughts, of ideas, of bits that have not been thought of before. It's in your 50,000 thoughts a day, it could be how many of those were kind of new ideas, but it depends on what you want to do with it. In every process, there's this innovative thinking called divergent thinking, associative thinking, you're looking like the big integrative thinkers, you're collecting everything you can about a topic across the board and you're finding new connections. So if you open in your thinking, if you have a growth mindset, you're more likely to have a big bandwidth here where you can find new connections. Divergent thinking, creativity, innovation, wonderful process. I happen to have also found it in art. I love painting on Saturday afternoons, I paint. Because the non-conscious brain is not a speaking brain. It's about, it's about ideas and patterns. And my, I stumbled upon art, not um, abstract art, as a way of exploring that. And I've created symbols, 26 symbols, like a new language, 26 letters, 26 symbols. So that was my journey of art. And I've painted most of my life because it's like, that's my training of my non-conscious brain. And it's not specific pictures about the brain, but some of it was about brain, the brain, the patterns of how the brain works. Some of it was about little simple outlines of the face with patterns of what we see in the brain. And I've studied the way you can use oil paint to generate micro, micro patterns and then macro patterns of brain states. So it was just a way of me to try and find a language for reflecting these 85 billion neurons and how it does all the stuff we're talking about. So that was my ideas for me that I discovered, but also in my work life, I had to come across doing minimum viable products about the brain. And that was when I was thinking divergently. So for example, I was open and discovered this six breaths per minute. I created a product that basically helped you Breathe at six breaths a minute and work out exactly what your best breathing rate was that was going to put you in the best state. Many products, that was what I did for a living. I found little minimum viable products and then handed them over to people who were good at implementing them in the real world. That's called convergent thinking, where you take the ideas and you implement them. Now this is still innovative. Every one of these execution steps in the real world is pretty innovative. And the world's a pretty competitive place. So by the time you 
think about this and are looking for your own livelihoods, you will see that the world has already moved from being kind of all about skills to being about innovation. The innovators are moving higher and higher up the food chain in terms of impact in building stuff that human brains and human economies now, le now need. So yes, my bias, my bias is that this matters the most. But I certainly do not underestimate implementation, execution, product market fit, finding the best, quickest return on investments, if that's the world that you want to live in. I've lived in both of these worlds as an academic at a university and running a brain institute. And then I listed a public company and try to converge these ideas into the real world, because that's what I'm interested in, applying brain insights and products in the real world. But you'll find what you want to do. But the principle is about divergent, convergent thinking and um, where do you fit with it or learn how to use this and how to switch if you need to, even from that mode to that mode. But usually people are, are usually preferentially kind of best connected up, wired and educated and trained and conditioned and habits in one or the other, usually, but sometimes both. Integrators are both, usually never to the same degree. Very, very few people I found who have both. I was much better at this than that. I was actually not the best implementer at all. I thank goodness I had and found people who were really good at this. So it's kind of that's kind of the story, really. Um, okay, so the last piece: brain-based societies. This is my pitch about why I think you should be a brain warrior with integrative thinking. The world is an amazing place. What a privilege to be part of it with this incredible brain that we happen to have been lucky enough to get. But what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to choose to put your attention? Personally, we've discussed your own self of se sense of self, your sense of self-regulation, your sense of self-peace, your sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Then you're going to have relationships. Can you apply these principles to find an aligned partner? Probably not going to get it right the first time. But you'll learn about the decisions and how hard it is to get it right and how many pressures there are in the whole man-woman game to find somebody that's aligned with where you're going and where you want to grow together and be. And I'm not just talking about a marriage partner. It could be friends. It can be people at work. I'm at the age now where I prefer not to deal with anybody that's not aligned because it's such a waste. It's so hard. It's like fitting a square peg into a round hole if you're not aligned. And you now hopefully know by now what I mean by aligned. Non-conscious and conscious brains attuned and aligned. And then there's your society. So I don't want to get morbid about society. I mean, the coronavirus pandemic's like a little scary enough. It's the sixth virus that's come across from the animal weirdness of the way we treat animals into the human chain. And, but, but I will say this, there are lots of other threats. There's bioterrorism. There's nuclear potential holocaust. There's um, the environment. The world, the humans, nine billion humans are, are really messing with the balance, the homeostasis of the environment in a way that's already, we're seeing real consequences and that could really be catastrophic. And there's an incredible abomination in the way that resources are distributed. There's a 199% gap of a very, very small number of people who control most of the resources. So there are some very strange inequities. There also are some odd things about tribalism. Tribalism, which was very important to make people feel safe. Them, us. We're the us. Them, different, different skin color, different shape. But human brains are all so similar. 99.99% of genes in human brains are the same. So the them, us is kind of just not true. It's kind of a human, understandable initially, way of feeling safe by numbers. Because if you're dealing with your us group, you're likely to 
get more benefit and be given preferential treatment and you're likely to benefit and secrete oxytocin by belonging. And then religion did something really fascinating where they said, look, this is challenging stuff, this world. We want to feel safe. So let's find a way where we can also put our energy into stuff bigger than ourselves. It's, who knows? We don't, let's be humble about this. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang. There could be other forces. Um, I, I doubt it, but I'm open to anything. Um, but, but the point was that religion had developed some wonderful ideas about how to deal with the anger, lust, and greed that is a sort of byproduct of this continuum of humans where there's some instability and there's some, a lot of opportunity emerged for greed and a certain type of person was gravitated to become those, those incredibly opportunistic, greedy and lucky people. Now, often those people, the one percenters, you know, they, they can be super um, magnanimous. There's one in particular that I'm thinking of who's developed the most incredible facilitatory work on the planet with all of his billions. But most, I've met some of them, you actually have members of your own family that could be one of them, become one of them, which means you're more likely to get, become one of them. But most of them are just lucky. And they're not the sort of sharpest tools in the shed, usually. But they become very disproportionately powerful and they usually use that very, very ineffectually. Many examples. I'm not going to dwell on it, but study it. There's some where even people have like stolen an idea and then they scale and they, one in particular that I can think of now has become part of perverting even truth, even information on the planet. They've been f complicit in not helping to shape information itself. That is really dangerous when even truth, objective truth is being messed up, messed around with. But it's reality. The dark forces of humanity have dominated. The history of the world is the history of wars. And those wars have usually been caused by extreme religious views. So it's very odd to me that because I mean, just a minute on religion, I mean, you'll find out for yourself. If you find that, as I say, the ideas of religion are wonderful and I, I personally think it would be a great time to integrate them. All the ideas about how to deal with the anger, lust and greed, how to have ideas about thinking about the future. Now, many religions promise eternal life in various forms. All 2,400 religions find a way in which they project themselves, sell themselves as special. Because the brain wants to be special. And the brain wants them and us, they want to belong, believe. So, that's fine. But the unintended consequence was that there are extreme people in religions where they pervert this, these wonderful ideas and have often facilitated wars and could still facilitate, trigger enormous challenges to the planet and to, to people. So it could be a good time. It is a good time to, to integrate those ideas and move to a more of a brain-based meritocracy. But in a, I don't have the answers at all. I'm just sharing ideas with you. But what I do hope is if you do become brain-based warriors, to at least be open to, um, to not buying into any of those extreme destructive forces on the planet. One as well is just eating animals. It doesn't make sense. It turns out that the animals are all pumped with antibiotics. Um, animal flesh is toxic to our systems. But we've been conditioned. And there's an animal industrial complex, there's an oil industrial complex, there are war industrial complexes, military industrial complexes, there are drug industrial complexes. I, it's tough. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a seriously challenging place. So finding, you can't take it all on, right? But when you, my hope is that you find your passion, that you do not eat animals, and for the sake of your children, that you do not condition them to eat animals. There is a in addition to the 
massive pandemics that they've caused so inadvertently, um, we do not have dominion over other animals, as Darwin showed us. We, our, our brains are all like remarkably similar, actually. And our genetics now are actually incredibly similar. 98.6% of the genes of chimpanzees are the same as humans. 99.9% .9 of humans have the same genetics. So it's kind of like perverse. But these cycles are hard to break. Conditioning is tough to undo. Rewiring your brain takes thought and realism. There's no point in being a brain warrior in a completely misguided cause. No point whatsoever. But you're coming at a time where the medium and the message has converged. The World Wide Web is now available to you. And your reach to doing anything that you choose will now accelerate. You know, all the databases in the world are soon going to be interconnected. Whether it's for about the brain or about product or about ideas, it's already kind of happening. And will certainly have happened by the time you see this video. So there you are. My pitch is a difficult one. Why would you choose a path where the reality in a brain-based universe seems to be that the harsh reality of the world is that there's not necessarily an afterlife as religions are proposing to people, which gives some people comfort, many people comfort. It would give me comfort if I thought it was true. Um, why would we develop another kind of cultural approach if, if there were tremendous benefits to 199% or um, all the other things that I've mentioned to eating animals? Is taste good enough to kill 50 billion animals a year that are actually harmful to us? Um, I don't know the answer, but I do know that you've arrived at a time where what you do could have an enormously disproportionate effect. And if you turn out to be a one percenter, use it judiciously. If you turn out not to be, find your mission, find your passion. And I hope it's as a brain-based warrior and an integrated thinker.